This is Gareth Southgate, and this is the Three Lions Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Three Lions Podcast. My name is Russell Osborne and this is an independent England football supporters podcast. I hope I find you well. Coming up on this episode, I will be taking a look back at the Lionesses' recent double header, home and away to Belgium in the Nations League. And I'll shortly be joined by the Evening Standards' Dom Smith to look at those games. And I'll also be paying my own tribute to Sir Bobby Charlton, who sadly passed away recently. So before we chat with Don, let me just advise you of how the group stacks up, the Nations League group, uh, and also the other groups. Now, the Lionesses are in Group A1, and after the home game, which they won 1-0, thanks to a 15th-minute Lauren Hemp goal, uh, the same evening... The Netherlands beat Scotland 4-0. So the the table after match day three, uh, everyone had played three games. The Netherlands were top with six points. We were second also with six points, uh, but second because we were beaten by the Netherlands in match day two, wasn't it? Belgium were third with four points and Scotland fourth with just the one point. Then there was the away game. We lost 3-2 in Louvain in Belgium. After being 2-1 up, thanks to goals from Lucy Bronze and Frank Kirby. Great to see her on the score sheet. Uh, It was her first since the Euro semi-final win over Sweden. But it wasn't to be. In the other game, the Netherlands, well, they beat Scotland by a goal to nil at Hamden. And these defeats are now coming a little more regularly than we'd like for the Lionesses. It was Australia in a friendly earlier this year. Spain, of course, in the World Cup finals. Uh, The Netherlands and now Belgium in this Nations League campaign. So after four games, the table now looks like this. The Dutch are top with nine points. Belgium move above us with seven points. We are in third place with six points and Scotland still remain bottom with just the one point. Now just going across the groups, in Group A2, France are top with 10 points from four games, followed by Austria with seven points, Portugal three and Norway two. Now of course you get through to the the Nations League finals and win it, you have the chance, well you will, go to the Olympics. France, of course, as hosts of the Olympics next year, are already qualified. In A3, Denmark, they are top with a maximum 12 points from four games. Germany, nine points. Iceland, three. And Wales, unfortunately, on zero points. And then Group A4, Spain. Despite all their troubles, like Denmark, are top with 12 from four games. Sweden a second with seven points, Italy four points, and Switzerland, they are bottom with zero points. So no confirmed Nations League final places as yet, or relegations from the the top tier. But we do know that the Republic of Ireland have been promoted to Group A for the next campaign, Turkey, they've also been promoted from Group C after maximum points from four games. And from what I can gather, I think they are the only actual movements, promotions, relegations from this round of matches. I did mention in the last episode about Israel. Uh, They're in Group C4. Obviously, their group is in a, a little bit of disarray for obvious reasons. Uh, But Estonia are top of that, having played four with seven points. Kazakhstan are second with four points from two games. Israel are third with three points from one game. 
and Armenia are bottom, having played three, but they have no points. At the moment, I'm not 100% sure what is going to be, what UEFA have in mind for that group. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see how it how it all unfolds. So now we know where we stand. Let's have a chat about those two Lionesses games and welcome back the Evening Standards, Dom Smith. Hello, Russell. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Very well. Now, this Nations League campaign may be proving to be a uh, a little harder than than some may have foreseen. Uh, two wins, two defeats so far, and, and one win, one defeat in this most recent rounds. Well, I think it was 35 games under Serena Wiegmann before England actually lost a game. So, yeah, it has been a it has been a, a departure from what we're used to um, under that manager. And yeah, it, it is proving difficult. I, I always thought that Belgium are a tricky opponent. I didn't quite expect them to beat us, though. No. So yeah, it has been it has been a strange one, hasn't it? It has. Let's just we'll take a look at at both games as as we saw them. The first game was in Leicester. Uh, just quick, really run through the team: Mary Earps, Lucy Bronze, Neve Charles, Kira Walsh, Alex Greenwood, Millie Bright, Chloe Kelly, Georgia Stanway, Alessia Russo, Ella Toon, and Lauren Hemp. Uh, as I've said, it ended in a one uh, nil victory for us, thanks to a Lauren Hemp goal that came via came via a Millie Bright header off the post, which came via a Chloe Kelly corner. I was watching it. And for the first, I don't know, first first ten minutes, um, we were all all over Belgium. Um, and I said, "This is this looks like this is going to be one way traffic," um, but it it didn't really pan out that way, despite the the earliest goal. No, absolutely not. England, it feels England haven't really put together a, a solid ninety minute performance that they can be proud of for I'd say quite a while now actually I, th- I think some of their displays in, in the World Cup were okay in parts and some of their displays in this in this inaugural Nations League campaign have been okay in parts for example the first half against Scotland which I think was England's opener of, of this campaign was was, yes. was really good but the overall match performance maybe wasn't and yeah I, I don't feel like England have necessarily been able to put together a performance which from the first minute to the last is broadly speaking one that that, that will please the manager and her assistant manager Arian Verink and people like that it feels like England are going in moments at the moment doesn't it it feels like they're they're having 10 minute spells here and 15 minute spells there and, and but failing to really knit them together if you know what i mean yeah the the panel on ITV uh, last night were were saying something similar. Uh, Enia Luko, Karen Carney, and Wright um, saying it is just just a little bit off balanced um, and, and just a bit disjointed. Do we think we can put our finger on it? What it could be? I, I, I think maybe there's a chance that some of England's most crucial players are not in the world's best form. Um, I, I don't know how much emphasis I would put on that as being a, a major reason why. Um, but I wouldn't say a huge number of the current England team are in exceptional form at the moment. Maybe there's a bit of a hangover from a World Cup, although that's very difficult to measure. And people use that phrase, don't they? Oh, yeah. England, you know, you know, e- England overturned any potential hangovers after the World Cup by beating. Well, we we never really know what that means. Um, but if it is a thing, then maybe that's part of it. Maybe also England are just playing a higher caliber of opposition. Maybe the Maybe the England could have put together the same performance that they did in defeat to Belgium last night against Latvia and come out with a fourteen nil win in which it didn't it didn't really matter. So uh, maybe the caliber of opposition England are playing is is the difference. Um, so yeah, it's it's difficult to it's difficult to see um, what, what what that could be. Um, I do think though that England have got a bit of an issue with over committing players forward. I, I do think England were quite open in defence, quite porous in defence during the World Cup. I'm not going to say that they conceded so many goals because clearly they didn't, but I do think that they were too open at the back, um, over committing players. And I think that that continues into this autumn period. I mean, I don't know if 
any of the listeners can remember the brilliant goal that Sam Kerr scored against England in the semi-final. That that yes. came when she received, I think there was an England mistake, but but she received the ball and there was a gaping hole between Millie Brighton and, and the defender. I can't remember who it was, maybe Jess Carter, who was the other side of her. The sort of hole that, that you do you will get punished for if you if you're going to allow a player of Sam Kerr's calibre to turn around and run at you. And that's exactly what happened. She scored. So um, yeah, I think we saw a bit of that again against Belgium uh, in Leuven last night. So, yeah, worrying signs for England's defence, but uh, at least they have got two wins on the board and they are able to build on that uh, in the last two matches. Yeah, no, I think you're referring to yeah Tessa Vallot's, um goal where she she ran through um, and, and put the ball past Mary Earps in deep into first half injury time right. last night. Yeah, very similar to the the one that Sam Kerr scored. But just just maybe going back to that that first game, um, Neve Charles coming in for a start, which she hadn't done for a little while, um, was was good to she see. She had a um, a good impact on the game, and it was great to see um, Frank Kirby. Uh, made her return in that game, coming on as a substitute for for Ella Toon. Great to see Frank Kirby back, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just to touch on Neve Charles as well, we, we went up to St George's Park last week to to speak to some of the players, the media, and and Neve Charles was one of the players that was put up to speak, and she spoke very well on a number of issues, but. You can just see that she she looks like an like one like an older player now, not not old, but a more experienced player, and she certainly plays like it. And I think maybe five years ago we would hear Emma Hayes on England commentary um, while also being Chelsea manager, maybe saying, "Oh, I'd like to see Neve Charles given a chance," but but she's obviously such a young player. And now, when you hear in recent months, when you've heard. Emma Hayes on commentary or indeed being interviewed in her role as, as Chelsea manager about the potential of Neve Charles breaking further into the England team. She's really banged the drum for Neve and she's said this is a player who I think is, is England's solution at le- on the, the left side, um, especially if Alex, Alex Greenwood is going to be started to use to be used as a, as a centre-back more often. I think Neve Charles is an extremely well-balanced player. I was at Stamford Bridge a couple of weeks ago for Chelsea versus Tottenham on the opening weekend of the WSL and she assisted both of, of Chelsea's goals and was ex- or I think maybe, maybe Chelsea scored three and she assisted the first two but she was certainly excellent yeah I thought she played really well in the mm. opener against uh, Belgium in this international break so I think that's a player who will be a mainstay in the England team certainly in the England squads for for years to come now uh, and obviously great to see Frank Kirby back and she took her goal superbly she's not someone with a ruthless goal scoring record that maybe she had when she was 23 or 24 a young player at, at Reading and then at Chelsea but it's not really about that her what's magical about her is how well she keeps the ball how she how intelligently she brings others into play and how unselfish she is but we still know that when she gets an opportunity to shoot she can be you know ruthless with it and she and she certainly was tucking it into the corner through a a, a sea of bodies really yeah, no, re- really good effort. Let's let's move on to that game. Um, there was there was just the the one change in the lineup that Serena announced, and it was Kirby in for Toon. She uh, she started from the off. Um, it was the the opening goal um, for Belgium came. Uh, I must admit, I I missed the first ten minutes of this game. Um, well, I, I came in just as the goal had been scored. Um, was a was a free kick. And I, I don't know whether I don't know whether to blame Mary Earps for it. Um, she seemed a little out of position. She um, did, and she had didn't to sc- well break for it, did she? No, she was scrambling across um, across her goal line, and something that I think it was Ian Wright pointed out in the after match game that the the wall that that I assume. Um, Mary had set up herself it was very lopsided in height and it's the first time I've really sort of heard something like that being spoken about I think Georgia Stanway and and it may even have been Neve Charles were on the end of the wall and Millie Bright who is who is a 
a touch taller than both of those and someone else standing to her would have been her right i believe it was um so denive who who scored the the free kick and and it was a fantastic free kick um had had quite an easy sort of area to aim for um so it was it was a bit of an unfortunate goal that that we scored that i think could have really been prevented yeah i agree i don't think that the goalkeeper looked braced for it uh, but yeah i also don't think that the that it was necessarily a, a free kick that was bound to beat the wall it was one that the maybe the wall could have dealt with so um it was it, you know, look it's a great strike she's oh, yes. seen a gap and she's managed to execute it and it's one thing finding um, a spot of the goal that's not going to be defended. If you put it there, it's another thing putting it there. So fair play. Um, yeah. But equally, yeah, I, I, in your words, it certainly could have been prevented, yeah. yeah. But let's, let's just mention, I think um, Mary Oaks came fifth in the the recent Player of the Years, I think, wasn't it? In, um, what do they call it? The, the, the Ballon d'Or, yeah. Ballon d'Or, yeah. So, so I mean, we all know she's a... A fantastic goalkeeper, um, but it's some of the football is a, an ever learning game for for those that play it and those that watch it. I think we're, we're all learning all the time. There was an unfortunate incident in the game where where Alex Greenwood had a, an unfortunate clash of heads um, with uh, Belgian counterpart. By all accounts, she's she's up and moving around. Uh, I imagine she's just got a uh, quite a headache. I would imagine this morning, um, but that. That was 14 minutes of injury time um, that was added on to the, the first half. This It's important, so much so now, isn't it, that, that players are given the right amount of treatment, especially with, with head injuries, isn't it? Absolutely. It was, uh, yeah, it was just distressing to see that Alex Greenwood went down under that clash, and it was it was it was really good to see, to hear the news that she was back up and talking relatively soon after the um the aftermath of the match yeah well one would assume that maybe she won't take part in the that in, Man- in Manchester City's next game are they are they given a a period of time that they can't play is that right well I know that there's certainly a a, a period of time a minimum period of time during a match in which the doctors have to assess a player they can't go under that time um but yes, I think there is a period of time uh, with concussion where you have to stay. I think it may be 10 or 11 days. Uh, I'm not quite sure on that. No. Um, but yeah, that does exist. And actually, that's what's kept uh, Lauren James out of these two matches is the fact that she got um, concussed in training. Um, and although she was OK afterwards, she, she's not allowed to feature in the game. So, yeah, that, that is a that is a thing. Oh, very interesting. Because I was, I was going to come on to Lauren James and say maybe... She was a player that that we missed against against Belgium. What with Alessia Russo's maybe lack of confidence, um, I, I wasn't aware of of the situation with Lauren James, but that but that explains it. The after um, Alex Greenwood had been taken off, fortunately, it didn't really hamper the game. Um, we uh, we equalised fairly fairly soon afterwards. A a Chloe Kelly free kick uh, found Lucy Bronze free, who sort of looped it into the goal. Chloe Kelly again assisting, as she did with the uh, the first goal, or the only goal in Leicester. Yeah, and Chloe Kelly's on outstanding form at the moment for England and for her club. With Lucy Bronze, it's been really incredible to see, probably for the last five years, her heading ability really come to the fore. And she scored an excellent header uh, in Sunderland in the opener against Scotland. And of course, she scored another brilliant header last night. It's a real addition to her game that actually I think England lack in other positions. I'm not sure they're necessarily aerially dominant in centre-back um, besides maybe Millie Bright. I, I mean, we know that Leah Williamson is is decent with her head. She's not exceptional with her head when she comes back. And and, and Jess Carter and uh, Alex Greenwood, it's fair to say that's not the, the, their their best attribute. Um, but yeah, for, for Bright to be someone who's an aerial threat with real prowess in that area on top of the centre-backs, that can only be a positive. And it showed itself again last night. Um, all right, I'm saying she's not even the, the tallest of players, is she? Oh, no, 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 quite. Absolutely not, no. no. Uh, then uh, then we then we had Fran Kirby's goal after a, a great Lauren Hemp run into the box and and cut it back for, for Fran to... 
to place it into the goal. Great, great goal. And I thought that was we were gonna sort of go into the into the break with a with a two one lead, but it was that that injury time that Belgium came back into the into the game and, and the goal we mentioned uh for like running through Carter and Bright because well Neve Charles and and Lucy Brons were sort of pushed further up the field, which is what we mentioned earlier on, wasn't it? Yeah, and it's a sign of good attacking intent when your fullbacks are high, but it's sometimes that can be really quite defensively naive to to have them both up there and especially if they're not going to get themselves back at, at the possibility of a a breakaway from the other team. And that's exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. And Tessa Volat is a good player. Uh, didn't just carry the ball well and, and get between the centre-backs, but also tucked it away very nicely. And that was a goal at a time which will have killed England because, you, as you mentioned, if you score so close to half-time, you mm-hmm. expect to take that lead into into half-time rather yeah. than be picked back yourself. So, yeah, difficult for, for England to accept that. And, uh, yeah, sadly, they weren't able to to make make good on on uh, the 45 minutes ahead of them. Yeah, I'd, I'd forgotten. She actually played for Manchester City a couple of seasons back, um, Tessa Volart. Yes. Um, Alessia Russo. Um, so I, I think she's there's there's something there, isn't there? She's, she's just lost that little bit of confidence at the moment. She had a couple of opportunities that Alessia Russo from a year or so ago um, would have put away with a plum, wouldn't she? But uh, she scored a couple for Arsenal already, I believe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she's just a player who's lacking a bit of confidence. It was really interesting to hear Jonas Eideval, the Arsenal manager, speaking about her a few weeks ago when I was at one of his press conferences mm. and a journalist asked him to mm. explain, tactically at least, why Alessia Russo was such a a target for Arsenal this summer. And And, and he basically said, well... There aren't. It's very seldom that you get player that you get a player with all of her attributes at the same time. Her mm. her speed, her strength, her intelligence, her mm. ability to uh, to shoot accurately and powerfully. Yeah. Um, sort of all all these um, facets. So yeah, I mean it's uh, it, it's difficult to see what what he means at the moment. It's fair to say, but we know that there's a real player in there, and I I do, I do think that she probably is a confidence player. She 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 does seem to play with her eyes to the ground when she's not really on it, and she'll be maybe looking up and and a bit more, you know, almost holding her head up a bit higher when when things are going well in, in a genuinely like in a in a real sense rather than kind of in a metaphorical sense. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit difficult to see, but look, she's too good for that kind of thing to go on for 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 very long at all. Oh yeah, well, we'll uh, we'll ex- expect her to be in the the next squad, and and it only takes a goal. It doesn't matter how it comes um, for no. her to to put that smile back on her face and, and start putting the uh, the goals back in. Uh, the winner from Belgium came via the penalty spot, unfortunately, uh, handball by uh, by Georgia Stanway. One one of those things. Um, Mary Earps dived the right way, but it was it was just just too much for her. And, and as we say, it's it's just that maybe that just that cohesion that we used to seeing with the lionesses that is just just missing at the moment. That in in normal time, recent times, um, we would have held that game out maybe for a draw or or, or for a for a win. It's it's not the end of the world. Um, but it's it's plenty to learn from that that fixture, those two fixtures, isn't there? Absolutely. Um, it makes the odds of England winning this group less, but I think it makes the odds of England arriving at the European Championships in 2025 long way away. Of course, you know, with more to learn from and 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 aware of faults that they can't make again, errors that they can't make again. You know that that's much more likely when you've had difficult nights. So, um, every, if everything's going plain sailing forever, then when in a tournament it's suddenly not, you're probably scratching your head and you're not quite sure what to do. So it's better for them to get it out of their system now. I think. Yeah. Well, the the next two fixtures and the last for this year in the Nations League, first uh, of December, the Lionesses host the Netherlands at Wembley. Uh, on the same night, Belgium hosts Scotland. And then to round it off on the 5th of December, 
Scotland, they host us up at Hampden Park. Uh, I have seen tickets are available for that for for England fans in a designated England section. Uh, and then there's the the Lowlands Derby, Netherlands against Belgium to to round off this group. Now, what I hadn't actually factored in is that in this group, uh, and I think it's hey, maybe just in the Women's Nations League is that if you finish in third place in the group, then you qualify for the relegation playoffs, where you'll play a League B runner-up over two legs in February of next year. So we finish in second place and nothing happens. We remain in, in the top tier, top group for the next campaign. Obviously, win the group. We go forward to the, the finals um, in, in next year. Um, but yeah, we don't really want to be finishing in third place, do we? Well, it depends how many goals you'd like England's players to score in February. Because if you finish third and you play someone from League B, I suggest England might have some pretty big wins under their belt. So, yeah, I, I think, but I think England would be okay. Yeah, we don't have that in the the men's nations league, do we? No, no, we don't know. Ah, but uh, oh, interesting facet for the. Uh, for the group that's still to pan out. Uh, yeah, so Dom, thank you very much, as always, for joining us. Always good to hear from you. Anything exciting going on in your world at the moment? Well, just trying to get enough sleep, to be honest. I'm looking forward to the uh, looking forward to the international break with the men's side coming up. That should be good. Obviously, we've we've already qualified, but it'd be good to finish with um, you know as many wins as possible, rack up those victories ahead of the Euros in Germany. So um, yeah, that's that's something I'm looking forward to certainly exciting times thank you very much for joining us and yeah let's let's speak again let's do thank you very much some sad news as i'm sure you've heard saturday the 21st of october saw the passing of one of England's and Manchester United's finest, Sir Bobby Charlton, or Robert Charlton, to give him his proper name, aged 86. Born October 11th, 1937, in Ashington, Northumberland, younger brother of Jack, Bobby was pretty much a one-club man spending the vast majority of his career at Manchester United between 1956 and 1973, where he played 758 times, scoring 249 goals. He famously won the FA Cup, the old First Division, twice in 65 and 67, and then the European Cup in 68, scoring and beating Benfica at Wembley and it was after that that he won the Ballon d'Or although now widely known as being the World Player of the Year award back then it was predominantly an award for European based players he was the second Englishman to win it after Stanley Matthews won it 10 years earlier for his England career well that began in 1958 under Walter Winterbottom, making his debut away to Scotland in a 4-0 victory. Scored the third goal that day, and this only a couple of months on from the Munich air disaster. England in the white shirts meet Scotland at Hampden Park in the last game of the season's soccer internationals. But Tom Finney is soon bringing it back again. He beats Alec Parker. He centres, and Bobby Charlton runs in for a magnificent goal. He would be selected for four World Cups. 1958, 1962, 1966 and 1970. Of course, his finest hour wearing the Three Lions came in 1966 where, of course, he was part of the team that won the Jules Rimet Trophy under Alf Ramsey. He scored England's opening goal in the tournament. After drawing 0-0 against Uruguay in that next game against Mexico, he scored the first in a 2-0 victory. And then he scored both goals in the semi-final victory 
against Portugal. Ritz screamed on someone now, and it's still good. Hunt! Charlton has scored! Bobby Charlton gets his 39th goal for England. England making Portugal chase. And it's Hurst. Five minutes running by Hurst back to Charlton. This could be it, it is! And that could be the goal that puts England in the final. Jose Augusto, England are in the final of the World Cup. We will never forget this night at Wembley. A sensational, superb victory. Bobby Charlton getting the two goals. 106 caps, 49 goals. A record that he held for a very long time before Wayne Rooney finally beat it. Gary Lineker had the chance to match it but famously fluffed his chance. Bobby's last game for England came in the 1970 World Cup in the quarter-final match against West Germany. England had led 2-0 until the 68th minute when Franz Beckenbauer pulled a goal back. A minute later, Alf Ramsey would sacrifice Charlton for Colin Bell. Germany would equalise in the 82nd minute and would then win the game in extra time. England, the holders, were out, and Bobby Charlton wouldn't pull on an England jersey officially again. Many will have heard of the Munich air disaster, but for those that maybe haven't, please just take a moment to read up on it. It was a moment that propelled Manchester United's name into many people's consciousness back in 1958. Charlton survived it, whilst 23 of the 44 passengers unfortunately perished. In 2020, he was the last living survivor of the crash. He would go on to play for Preston North End in 1974 for a season. He'd also managed them too. He was knighted in 1994 and he helped in many bids for the Commonwealth Games and the Olympics for his country. I met him once. I would have been eight, nine years old. I'm sure it was at a local garden centre. I dug the photo out and popped it up on Twitter recently. Uh, it's a photo of him. He signed my Panini 1987 sticker album. Uh, it's on the front of it, now slightly faded, but it's there. Looking at the photo, uh, he was promoting his Bulldog Football Skills Club. And I have to be honest, at that age, I wouldn't have appreciated just who he was and his background, other than that he played for Manchester United and England. Now, from that 1966 match-winning team, only Sir Jeff Hurst remains. Although it's important to remember that just as today's teams are selected from a squad, so did the 66 one. And still with us from that squad, with Hurst, are George Easton, Terry Payne and Ian Callaghan. And in recent weeks, with various moments of silence or applause, it's been wonderful to see this one fully respected. And from a Lioness's perspective, I held a moment's silence and laid a wreath of respect at St George's Park, which has a pitch named after the footballing legend. And I'm fairly confident that the senior men's home match against Malta later this month will have a moment's silence before kick-off. And if you have access to it, there is a great documentary on the BBC iPlayer that takes a look back at his life in his own words. It's well worth an hour of your time. I'd like to pass on my condolences and regards to Sir Bobby's family and friends. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'll be back with you very soon. I've got another in the series of Your England Journey. It's where fans share their stories of how they came to follow England and where it's taken them. 
Uh, it's not just for the men's team either. If you've been following the Lionesses, would be great to hear your stories. Why not drop me a line on email? Three Lions Podcast at gmail.com. Three, spell it out, T H R E E. Or on social media, just search Three Lions Podcast. I'll come up. Then, as Dom alluded to when I spoke to him, the senior men are in action very soon. I'll have a preview for the games against Malta and North Macedonia coming your way soon. So, until then, take care of yourselves. Cheers. <laughs>